So we'll get started. I'm sure a couple more people will be coming in. I'm Bill Sanders here from the University of Illinois and welcome to all of you who are um, both local. Ah, the crowds are coming in. Welcome to all of you that are both local and on one of our video feeds today. Uh, this is the TSIP Technologies for a Resilient uh, Power Grid uh, seminar series that we have once a month on the uh, first Friday of the month. Um, I want to make a couple of announcements before I, I introduce our speaker for today. Um, this is the last of our first season of, uh, of, uh, of speakers, so we're going to take a summer break as we do here in the academic world. We're going to be working hard, but we're going to take a summer break from this seminar series uh, and we will resume in September with the next talk. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's good to know. We'll be sending out an email to all of you about that, but we wanted to let you know that. Um, second, um, I wanted to remind you if you're interested and you hadn't signed up already, we're going to be having our TSIP summer school on security issues in control systems, and that will be in the Chicago area, quite at a, at a very nice uh, executive training center. Uh, in St. Charles, which is about 45 minutes drive from the O'Hare Airport, and that will be the week of June 13. So if you're interested in signing up, uh, there's a, 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 a deadline coming up soon in which the, uh, the registration fee will increase, so please go look at our website and sign up if you're interested in participating in that. And then finally, I think most everyone knows by now, but um, if you're remote and you'd like to ask a question and you're on WebEx, uh, you can raise your hand in that symbolic sense by pushing the button on WebEx and you can uh, then be patched in and, and either Michael will ask the question for you if you prefer or um, you can ask the question. Okay, so those are the announcements. Uh, today it's my really distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Jeffrey Katz. Jeffrey is the Chief Technology Officer for energy and the utilities industry at IBM. Uh, I really love his title. I can't resist saying it uh, first before I tell you more about him. Dealing with your smart grid insecurities. We'll find out what that really means. I, I know I always wake up in the middle of the night worrying about things. I'm not sure if these are the insecurities, but we'll find out. Um, he's involved with application, development, and innovation of IBM products in this space. Um, and uh, as you'll see, he has a long history of working in and with uh, the power industry. Uh, he's a member of the IBM Academy of Technology, which is a really elite group of technical people with IBM uh, that uh, uh, gives advice on a, on a variety of matters. And uh, before he joined IBM, he was the manager of the computer science department at the U.S. Corporate Research Center of ABB, another power grid related company, and then Alstrom. Uh, he's the author of six patents, and uh, he has a commercial general radio telephone license from the FCC, and I, I had to put that in. There's also a couple of other things. He's heavily involved in the first uh, Lego League, and I know my kids were very involved, and I was involved with first Lego League for a long time, so I think that's a really important thing. And uh, he's a longtime ham radio operator, so now we know what he does in the middle of the night. So Jeff, it's really great. He's on a, this is the last step of what's been a brutal travel week for him, which is, I don't think the last week of a brutal travel month, but we're really glad to have you here. Thanks very much for coming and we look forward okay. to your talk. Thanks, Bill. Okay, uh, what this title more or less refers to is we're not going to talk about innovations in elliptical curve cryptography or anything esoteric. We're going to talk about a lot of IBM's experiences in implementing smart grid projects and relating security issues. Okay? Uh, I assume, given the audience in this room, everybody can solve any given security issue. The real challenge is recognizing and identifying everything that really needs to be done to keep the, the smart grid secure. Oh, actually, I guess I should use this thing. All right, so the first thing we have to talk about is kind of like, why are we here and why are you here instead of studying for finals? All right, why does security, the smart grid, mean something so important in the first place? So we'll look at a, a couple of the typical issues. Uh, first, 
The power grid is national critical infrastructure, and we really can't afford a disruption. We can't afford loss of availability of all the systems of, so, that rely on electric power. Uh, there are process industries, whether it's petrochemical, pharmaceutical, or so forth, they cannot stand interruption of the power system and often invest in large diesel generators and other backup storage systems just so their electrical energy is continuous. But those usually have maybe a four or six hour lifetime of, uh, of operation based on available fuel and uh, capacity of the equipment. So you can have millions of dollars worth of inventory of things formed by continuous processes, food, drugs, petrochemicals, and so forth, if there's an equipment interruption. Uh, a lot of equipment, even in traditionally thermally fired uh, applications, is cooled by means of electric water pumped and cooling, so it can make a lot of equipment damage. Uh, the one that's more hacker prone actually is asset misconfiguration. Take something that exists in the grid and maliciously change it. Step the voltage up to your house to 130 volts and see what happens to your $4,000 plasma TV, for example. All right. Or in our house, if anything happened to Nintendo Wii, that would be a crisis to, on its own. Well, we have a Wii, but I can't, I'm really not supposed to mention product names in this talk. Uh, loss of data and confidentiality. Uh, this, of course, transcends many industries. The biggest uh, cyber threat is the one you don't know about because copying data out and understanding what companies' development plans are, what people's financial statements are, without destroying anything, you know, is your classic cyber issue because as you retain information or take information you shouldn't have access to, you know, it's really espionage, in effect. Personal in uh, injury, most utilities would tell you on their list of goals, safety is number one. Uh, a lot of that is related to the fact that electricity is just plain dangerous. Also, two-thirds of utilities population by headcount is usually the people running around fixing and maintaining the grid all the time. Uh, utility really wouldn't want somebody working on the grid on something that's supposed to be de-energized and surprise is energized again. And when any of those line technicians go to training, they're always told, treat everything as if it's live. All right, and they probably do. However, sudden re-energization of equipment is probably not something they really expected. Uh, going into the less uh, injurious aspects, uh, NERC and other aid federal agencies are empowered to fine, substantially fine utilities for violations of cybersecurity rules. All right, and if for the utility itself, there's the issue of loss of customer and public trust. It'd be hard for any utility to say, well, we didn't know there were any cyber threats going around. So if your system is cyber attacked, this is a kind of a serious public relations issue. Now, this becomes more important because you have to remember that many utilities, at least in first and second world countries, are not run by the government, but they're private companies that are given monopoly status by the state government, and therefore have to go to a public utility commission every time they want to do a new expansive project and you know get 10 cents a month added for 10 years to your electric bill or something like this. And you can imagine the Public Utility Commission, whose job it is to look after the public interest, how they would feel if a utility you know, suffered a cyber attack that materially affected electric production. Right, so those are all the reasons we're here. So let's get on uh, with more of this. All right, why do we have a smarter infrastructure? All right, uh, in the electric grid, uh, consumers are looking at variable pricing. Uh, one way to curb the electric demand in the U.S. and be a little greener is to realize that electric, electric production is not really a continuous thing in terms of pricing. When there's peak demand in the summer in August, I assume even in the Chicago area it must get hot in the summer, uh, you know, this is a big issue. You want to competitively price electricity. Uh, people want more information to control. People are interested in being greener. People want to be involved in the change of the electric grid. In utilities, it's a little clearer because what you'd like to do is have better monitoring control of the grid. The electric grid is one of the last uh, major infrastructure items uh, to be automated, okay, in a, in a full way. This happened probably 15 or 20 years ago you know, with the telephone system. The fact that you can pick up a cell phone and dial direct to someone in China right now is really amazing compared to what your parents grew up with, all right? Uh, it's, all, it's all due to automation. Uh, you want to reduce the cost to, to serve electricity to the customer base reliably. 
Uh, you want to adapt to changing uh, technology in, in digital electronics. You want to look at new information sources. And you want to be able to transform how your utility operates. So a lot of that is forced by uh, public regulatory decisions. For example, a lot of utilities are distribution, transmission, generation, three separate companies, and have effectively firewalls, not network firewalls, business firewalls between operation. Okay. Uh, what's involved in the smarter energy infrastructure? Uh, this slide is kind of patterned after a common theme you may have seen in some IBM advertisements around what we call the smarter planet. We would talk about things becoming more instrumented, more interconnected, and more intelligent. Uh, this slide, and we're not going to go over it in real detail, covers the different aspects of this and how it fits into the electric grid. All right, we start at the bottom, we have more smarter interconnected devices. Things that used to be simple electromechanical devices from companies, well, maybe I won't mention example companies because if I leave one out, they'll feel bad. Uh, companies that make electrical power system equipment are now taking things like electromechanical relays and closers and switch gear, adding microprocessors to them to provide a lot more non-operational information. So operational information would be, well, the power's on, the power's off, this is the voltage coming in, this is the voltage going out. Non-operational information, say, in switch gear might be, so how many milliseconds did it take the contacts to open and close? What was the length of the arc when you opened a, a 300 amp circuit? Things like this. All of these go a long way to helping the maintenance people understand what's going on in the equipment as it works. This is called non-operational information, and this is very valuable to utilities in maintaining a high level of uh, operational excellence. So a lot of the the devices you see here, switches, reclosers, these are all getting microprocessor based. And of course, as soon as you add something computerized to, to an item, you really start to have to look at the cybersecurity aspect of it. All right. Uh, on the other hand, within homes, appliances are getting smarter. Uh, probably in two years, you'll start seeing things that, uh, let's pick a national brand, like Best Buy or Sears or something, where the appliances are actually ready to receive demand response signals from the utility. But guess what? If you could do that, then some clever hacker on some you know, unidentified website is publishing, well, here is how to force you know, uh, this brand appliance on and off at will by yourself. right? Because if it has a computer in it, somebody needs to hack it. right? Otherwise, people would get bored. Uh, if we move up the scale here, uh, if we're going to achieve a, lot, a wide area smart grid communication system, uh, we're going to have to look at not only communication in the home th through the neighborhood, say for example in RF mesh networks you used to do smart grid, uh, a backhaul looking at the office and an extranet. Since utilities, at least in the US and some other uh, major countries are starting to get deregulated, you now have to have more formalized information exchange between the three parts. Well guess what, if you're not doing an extranet as a transmission company up to the generation company and down to the distribution company, someone now has a new potential web access method into your system, if you're, even if you're just exchanging data XML all right, as a, as a, as a web service. Okay? And then as we go higher up the scale, uh, there'll be more customer interface and mobile devices. There will be more sophisticated systems for outage management or work management systems and so forth. All those people driving around uh, bravely repairing the electric grid all the time, we're going to have more information in their cabs of their trucks, but that means it's going to be wireless communication and therefore there are other exploits like sending the repair crew the wrong information about what to repair and you know issues like this. So that's what's involved in the energy infrastructure and a couple of touch points on what some of the uh, uh, the security aspects could be, right? In general, what are the risk factors to, to a cyber infrastructure? And this slide is sort of electric oriented, but not really if, if you think about it. Uh, inf inconsistent information sharing among collabor in collaboration among stakeholders, all right? This is more your, you know, sending operators of control systems wrong advice. All right, interfering with collaboration between normally operating areas. Uh, Deperimeterization. If the sm if the grid, the computerized part of the electric grid is now all over the place because you're putting smarter circuit breakers, smarter substations, and so forth everywhere. So where do you draw the physical perimeter and say, aha, this is what we're defending against? That's awfully tough now. A simple firewall at the entrance to a data center is nowhere near sufficient. 
In fact, some people consider it may be impossible to say we're going to have a perimeter defense around the smart grid. The devices are going to have to kind of stand on their own. And as you get customers more involved, well, guess what? Some small fraction of the customers are your adversaries. So as you bring them into the fold, whether it's communicating about rate information or appliance use or something, you've created a path for a potential hacker. Uh, to the amazement of some other countries, in places like the US, the private sector controls most of the infrastructure. All right? Now, that itself is not bad. In fact, competition-wise, it's had a lot of good advantages over the decades. However, to lay down the law, so to speak, about what level of cybersecurity you must have if everybody's a private uh, investor-owned utility, or municipal even, this is a certain uh, administrative nightmare. All right? You've got to figure out who gets to say what, what's put in place. You may have to put regulation on the equipment suppliers also to say, oh, this switch gear certified for smart grid as far as cybersecurity goes. All right? uh, so there are pluses and minuses sometimes about uh, private sector control of public infrastructure. Uh, this clearly, as we talked about earlier, a high degree of dependence on the electric grid. Uh, the politest thing you could say is uneven application of security in the complex systems. As systems get more complex and you have interactions of systems and other systems, keeping track of what the security issues even are becomes more difficult. We'll see those later on. Okay? And then, of course, even if you ignore any, everything else, the adversaries are getting more uh, are gaining more advantages in their technological tools, all right? Okay, so all of this adds to potential risk and critical infrastructure. So it's a good, th what can we say? It's a good thing we have the TCI here at the university to help solve some of these problems. So let's look at some of the areas specifically to smart grid we have to deal with. Uh, starting at the beginning of, of things, as, pe as the consumer tends to think about it, there's advanced metering coming in, so-called smart meters. Uh, these are being rolled out in a fast pace, de uh, depending on what part of the country you're in. And there's a corresponding meter data management systems that control these things. Uh, on the power generation side, you've got contributed, distributed control and SCADA systems. This is nothing new, but you know how many of you have heard of the word Stuxnet in the last six months? All right. So the idea that a control system is isolated in a plant and therefore is safe, people are not sleeping so well about that anymore. And we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, too. Uh, substation remote equipment monitoring. Uh, most utilities have some kind of communication with substations, and that gets more, goes more to a TCP IP based situation, and you replace uh, some static point to point uh, protocols with routable protocols. Uh, there's a little more that you have to pay attention to besides just saying, aha, this is on a private subnet, so I'm good. All right? uh, people can be clever. Uh, back at the consumer end with the meter, uh, a lot of the meters are actually the last bit of communication between the head end and collector systems and the actual smart meter is done by RF. And you know, to say the fact that if you enable something in an RF instead of a wired connection, you've now kind of reduced its security profile. Or at least we can say you have given more challenges to the security professional to keep that system secure. Distributed generation. You can now not say all my generation comes from this big coal or nuclear plant with a 10-foot fence around it and guards, because as people bring in more renewable energy, well, guess what? You've got more places in the generation system now that are remote and possibly more exposed. Right? So you can see there's, there's a lot of places, and you know it's good we have a TCP IG just in time. All right? Uh, we, this slide is, uh, covers a lot of things. It'd probably be better to read after uh, we publish some version of this on, on uh, Bill's website. But this covers some of the overlapping areas. As most of you realize by now, so you can make a thing secure, and you make two things secure, and then you couple them together in a system. You still have to ask the question, is that combination secure? You know, Six secure things do not necessarily make a secure system. Uh, and that's how, why this diagram, Venn diagram type of thing tries to show here in terms of availability and coupling of systems. And this also gets into interoperability. Uh, some of you may be aware of some of the good work they're doing at the, the NIST SGIP, Smart Grid Interoperability uh, Panel, and Gridwise Alliance and Gridwise Architecture Council on smart grid security and interoperability. And 
some really good thought has to go into the fact that as something becomes more interoperable, that also can translate into the interface specification for communicating that device is now more public, and therefore is that helping enable uh, cyber threats, right? There's pluses and minuses to that, just like there are pluses and minuses to uh, people talking about open source operating systems and say, well, this must be more secure because everybody can look at it and find any vulnerabilities, versus this is proprietary, so nobody really knows what's inside, therefore it can't be hacked. You know, we could have a whole debate on that after, after the talk, for example. Of course, without mentioning any brand names. All right, so some examples of uh, smart grid threats. Uh, we don't really have, uh, looking at the time, we definitely aren't going through this whole table. Uh, but, you know, but some generic, generic categories. Uh, unauthorized or accidental disclosure of information. Uh, some of you may have read that uh, at some place in California, consumers are worried about people looking at smart meter data because it is emitted from the meter every 15 minutes. So one could theorize that, well, if somebody hacked into that, they could tell, well, the kids are now home because the electric use is shot up. Okay, because the stove is on and the plasma TV is on, and all these other kind of things. That's just a that's a piece of it, and it's a significant piece uh, because in this digital age, people are more worried about privacy than ever. Uh, but also remember, as utilities are deregulated, they now trade energy. They're power plants that operate as so-called merchant power plants. They bid into the power market. All right. And the millions, it's almost like a commodity now, exchange now. People can, there are millions to be made if you have a competitive advantage about who's going to bid what for what power, right? So it's not just the consumer aspect of privacy. It's also more or less the industrial espionage aspect of privacy in terms of smart grid. Uh, modification of information, changing or blacking out parts of the smart grid. You know, this is clearly something people are... Uh, first think about when they talk about smart grid security. You know, they, they have a mental picture of, you know, teenager all dressed in black, you know, turning off the south side of Chicago or something like that. I mean, that's the, uh, that's the movie version of it, but people still worry about it. Okay? Uh, it's probably better to go on to some slides that have more important content. All right, so where are some of the attack vectors we need to look at? Uh, they're indirect attacks through VPNs. They're direct internet attacks. Uh, you know, it should be clear to everybody, though it's not clear in the popular press, every time someone says, we're using an internet protocol, we're using TCP IP in our smart grid network, it does not mean it's connected to the internet. Though if you read some uh, less refereed articles, I suppose is the way to say it, uh, people often bridge, well, internet technologies mean something's connected to the internet, all right? Um, clearly, this is something that you wouldn't deal with. Uh, various types of wireless attacks. Uh, what if, for example, you had a uh, kind of demand response scenario where through your smart, your RF controlled smart meter, the utility with your permission or prior knowledge could turn off individual air conditioner units when the, you're running out of power. Okay? Uh, so what do you do? Well, you don't want to run, a, you don't want your air conditioner off, so you wrap the meter in aluminum foil. All right? I mean, that's that your most sophisticated attack. It's not even an attack, but it's preventing some information flow that disrupts the system. And if uh, ComEd, or that's probably the old name for the utility in this area, or is it still, is it current? Still it's still ComEd, okay. We're, we're in the All right, Amarant, okay. Uh, so many utilities change names these days as part of the corporate uh, restructuring. You know, they're counting on a certain amount of demand response to avo having avoided building some new power plant by leveling out the uh, load during the day, and they expect that if they drop uh, customers that are under these kind of uh, demand response contracts, that that load will actually disappear, for example. Uh, any network services between parts of utilities can be vulnerable. Uh, device communication. Uh, I had an interesting talk with one of uh, Bill's colleagues uh, this morning, and you know, he's working on the very important issue of sensor spoofing. You know, if you're building a whole smart grid is really based on a whole series of sensors, then maybe the easiest thing to do is send in wrong sensor information at the very beginning of the, of the information chain and let the other, knowing how the other systems will react, using that as a leverage point. Okay, and I thought it was a very interesting research, uh, you know, area to pursue is, uh, you know, how do you, if you've got many sensors on a transformer substation, how can you validate that none of those sensors are being attacked because you can 
use the physics of the system to derive what the proper operation sensor response should be. Uh, embedded community attacks, portable media attacks. Uh, you know, for example, if you have a secure control system with a uh, you know uh, off-the-shelf operating system as part of the HMI, then you really can't allow someone to bring in a flash drive that may have been at home on the same computer your fourth grader used to write his English assignment, because you know how secure a computer at an elementary school could be, and bring that into the office, plug it in, and have it activated, right? That's, no matter how, many, how much you buy from Cisco or somebody to prevent attacks, uh, portable media is a really suspicious outlet for getting uh, viruses in and out of secure areas. Obviously, inadvertently, which is the worst kind, it's, you know, because that's an actual employee-induced thing, even though it wasn't deliberate. Okay. Time is it? I'm halfway through. Okay. Uh, let's look at some of the solution points, uh, smart grid solution points in general with respect to security. Uh, we really kind of identify four of them at the meter end, the distributed control, substation remote monitoring, and advanced metering systems. Uh, and we'll look at those individually. Uh, again, we don't have to go through all of them, but we'll pick up some of the security concerns and possible solutions here uh, on some of these systems. So on the meter end, you know, the obvious, you want to detect any physical tampering with the meter, and most, most meters do that now. Uh, if you have a two-way protocol with it, it would be nice if that was kind of immune to simple RF sniffing. Uh, if you're doing distributed energy resources with net metering, that may take a uh, might be worth a 30-second explanation. In many areas of the country, people are allowed to have their own wind or solar on their home and sell any excess electricity back to the utility. All right? And effectively, net metering means how much electricity goes into your meter and how much comes back out that you generate. And you pay the difference, okay? You know, assuming that your consumed electric bill is more than what you generate. Okay? So obviously, there's another interesting point because if you send... If the meter is, tells the utility, oh, he sent in many more kilowatt hours than he's actually generated, then what are you doing? You're getting a check in the mail from the utility. That would not be what anybody was really looking for. Uh, most things in the utilities are built by companies to last decades, literally. All right? When's the last time a meter got changed in your house? So you saw a line crew replace a transformer in a neighborhood if it wasn't, for example, hit by lightning. That, well, that equipment is fairly well... Uh, implemented, and therefore utilities are used to saying a crew will go out, put on a smart meter on your home or something, and they expect not to really be out there again for another 20 years, literally. All right. So, since it's software-based, though, we have to look at how does some of the smart grid equipment get firmware updates. All right. You're not going to have an employee go up in a bucket truck, plug his laptop into a USB port, and reload it. That's not economical on the scale of a of utility. All right. So if you have remote firmware upgrades, in your equipment, then you automatically have another potential uh, takeover point. All right. Uh, remote disconnects, people sometimes think that will be uh, an attack point just because it's very visible to the attacker. So if someone figures out a way to say, all right, well, I don't like him, so I'm going to shut off his electricity because the meters have remote disconnect function. You know, to the, uh, to the less sophisticated attacker, that may seem to be... Uh, you know, a quick and easy kind of, kind of demonstration. So then we have here a few solutions. Uh, for example, we may want to look at dynamic key management on the, on the meters as far as protecting the firmware updates, okay? Uh, we may want to look at security event and information management. One issue with having a lot of embedded devices on the, on the grid is they're not really computers, are they? The little embedded computing devices may be running some version of you know, an embedded Linux or something, there's a lot stripped out of those to keep the, keep the cost down. So what's, if one takes away all security audit and logging functions, then like a regular computer, you can't go in with SNMP protocol and say, so from what IPs were you addressed in the last 24 hours? You lose a lot of the traceability because that's not really built into a lot of these embedded devices. You know, and that's a compromise between cost and complexity that the utility manufacturer would have to bear in the ability to do a full security audit of, you know, why is this device behaving this way and who, was it, who may have been infiltrating it. Okay. Uh, 
Let's talk about uh, substation monitoring. Uh, this is where and your substation, which is you can often visualize as that, you know, big green box behind a bunch of trees in the neighborhood. Uh, a lot of the local smart grid equipment will often connect into that substation. All right, so we have to look at how robust is the protocol between the substation and the, the head end equipment. Uh, what kind of authentication do we have for the people legitimately allowed to go in and operate that equipment? All right, because these are large enough that people actually go in and walk inside of the equipment and do upgrades and, and reconfigure things. Uh, logging, reporting all operation. A uh, physical security. People love to talk about cybersecurity so much they forget about physical security. One thing we've talked about with some utilities, for example, is take out the $100 uh, camera that maybe does seek closed circuit television monitoring of the substation, put in a $1,000 camera, and now you can do a detection between is that a twig lying on top of the substation, is that a squirrel, is that a person within the substation boundary? And we've actually talked to people about, well, if you can't get the operations people to pay the cost of a better camera system in the, in the substation, put an infrared uh, filter on it, aim it at the transformer in the substation, get a heat map, and make it also be used for maintenance. Because transformers do nothing else except have a lot of uh, cooling capacity they have to get rid of. That's why the, you see they have large uh, irradiated fins on them. Doing a th being able to do an online thermal mapping of a substation uh, becomes a clever way of thinking about security and maintenance coupled in, uh, in one improvement in the substation. Uh, RBAC, role-based access control, is an important part of the solution. Who is authorized to do what? Okay. Typically, anybody in a say, let's pick ComEd again. Anybody in a ComEd service territory can probably access most substations, all right, because the crews are shifted around a lot, and all the electric equipment looks the same. Uh, so keeping track of who's authorized to do what, and sometimes that is that depends on what time. Uh, There's a simple strategy we've talked to people about. People don't randomly go and fix the, the equipment; they're centrally dispatched. You know, someone gets a report that. You know, the smoke coming out of the substation, or the lights are off on the street. This is the common, you know, probable failure point. Somebody goes out. Well, a simple rule that says if the system that issues the work orders to the utility people coordinates with the, say, card key access at the security gate, then maybe it'll raise an extra level of authentication. So if a valid employee swipes a card at a gate to a substation that has no work order against it, maybe the system will blink a light that says you have to call in on your cell phone and identify yourself, right? So a lot of times, even though integration can be some of the holes in security, integration between different systems on the maintenance side can help with some of the security access points of view. All right, that's just uh, one example, right? Okay, let's go on to advanced meter data management system. Uh, Utilities get really most of their money by using the meter on your home or the meter at a large industrial campuses like this as basically the cash register. So protecting that information from a smart meter is very important uh, in terms of uh, what people in the industry tend to call revenue protection. Right? In some parts of the world, this is a much bigger issue than others. Uh, in certain countries, they have a, a good euphemism. They talk about... Uh, non-technical losses. So a technical loss may be something due to Ohm's law or short circuit somewhere in the system. A non-technical loss could be envisioned as taking a set of jumper cables onto the overhead power line and connecting it to your house and forgetting about the meter. All right. Uh, and this is actually a big issue somewhere. Uh, there's actually some, I see some of the people in the audience smiling, there are actually some even more interesting things we've been asked to look at by looking at some of the analytics of the data from a smart meter, like is this uses profile characteristic of growing marijuana? All right, because marijuana, for those of you that are doing it, have a uh, you use a lot of heat lamps, and heat lamps are big resistive loads, and the utility knows well how much resistive versus reactive loads tend to be used in different in residential areas, and there are actually projects that look at some of the metering data in the power factor and try to figure out, you know, should somebody be suspicious here or not, all right? This really depends on the culture in the country. I'm not saying they, anybody's doing that in the U.S. However, it's another aspect kind of related to security of how people, uh, you know, use some of this meter data. Uh, 
I mentioned before about demand side management, sending demand response signals in through your meter. It's an important issue in the manage, overall management of the power flow within the utility. They expect that they'll get a fairly good response rate to people that are candidates for this. They really can't have people, uh, you know, a lot of uh, diversion of the, of the signals for doing demand response and not get the, uh, the actual kilowatt hour reduction that they're looking for because then they'll actually have to go in to say a brownout type of operation, which is what they're trying to avoid with a legitimate demand response program in the first place. All right, and then we have some, uh, you know, some solutions here. Uh, first of all, digital encryption and, and signing of the data for confidentiality. All right, you'd like to, you you may be okay with the utility knowing about your smart grid uh, data and say a 15 minute usage at your home, but you may not want anybody else to know. So you really may like the fact that that data is encrypted. All right, so if it's pirated away. You, you don't feel that you've, your privacy has been protected. You know, it's not unlike all the credit card transactions that, that people do daily. Okay, distributed control and SCADA systems, all right? Uh, here things get more interesting because now you're involved in direct control of operational equipment, all right? Uh, people are concerned about things like, you know, well, if you have a, a piece of smart grid equipment that uses a certain protocol and behaves a certain way, uh, can hackers make a laptop version that emulates the operation of that? And since the electric grid is all over the place, physically, it's probably possible to connect your laptop in in place of some smart grid equipment and pretend you are a transformer or something else and send back illegitimate data, all right? So that's kind of the man in the middle attack looked at from a slightly different perspective, all right? That somebody's simulating that there being some electrical equipment, uh, you know, in the chain. Right? Uh, people want to look at, uh, I just mentioned a few of these hardened platforms. Uh, sometimes equipment providers may offer to the utility, well, we will help you with the maintenance of the equipment we provided you because we will remotely monitor it. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that as long as the utility is fully aware of it and it's gone through their security profile. So a company that has remote access to some of their equipment even on a read-only basis for looking for maintenance problems, can't cause any kind of trouble, all right? Because now you have a group of employees outside your utility that has some kind of access here, all right? Um, dealing with what kind of operating systems and are they secure inside an embedded device, all right? I mean, you look at how much is in your laptop these days. If these devices cost ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars for these smart grid devices, you can put a lot of computing power in there. All right, you want to make sure that the kind of operating system that people embed in these systems is is fairly well vetted, because as there are more and more embedded Linux systems around, the idea that well, an embedded Linux system is, you know more hacker proof than some other operating systems just because it's kind of stripped down. That kind of you know, security by obscurity thinking may not really be true anymore, all right? Uh, consistent security policy management. You want to know, because the electrical system is so interconnected, that if you're a very large investor-owned utility or a smaller municipal utility, uh, you have the same level of security. Because guess what? All those wires interconnect. The electric grid in the US is basically three different zones, east, west, and the independent state of Texas. All right, and then if you, uh, you can also count Canada in there, even though they have a DC uh, interconnect to kind of isolate the Canadian systems, but the US more and more takes in more uh, uh, inexpensive Canadian hydropower anyway. So there's a lot of interconnections here. That means the security fault one place in tampering with the grid can cascade. And those of you that remember the August 2003 blackout understand that you can cascade electrical failures. Maybe not the cyber part of the attack, but the actual electrical system uh, effect. All right, uh, a couple of things we suggest people look at uh, as smart grid for security. Uh, clearly, by law, you have to look at the NERC SIP uh, requirements. All right, uh, we suggest people have a, a standards-based industry framework approach, not an individual approach to different parts of the utility. Uh, I'll just pick out a, a few of these that we need to really talk about. Um, intrusion detection and protection Intrusion detection and protection are important because given all the vectors we've talked about, you cannot say, oh, I've done such a good job here, the bad guys will never get in. That's really not the best kind of 
egotistical way to design your security system. It might be better to say, I need to know if anybody bad is in because my security design may not be perfect through the variety of devices in the system, the amount of wireless in the system, and so forth. Uh, in fact, we've talked to people about going further and using techniques like uh, uh, stream processing technology to look at a wide area of events within the, within the electric grid and saying, let's categorize some of those into just ordinary operational events, maintenance type events, and security events. What if you had several substations fail within half an hour, yet electrically there was no common connection point, like they weren't all fed off the same wire in the transmission system, right? That might be called suspicious, whereas if they were all off the same transmission line, then you might say, well, we must be failing the transmission line, and that's why these six substations have seemed to have failed over the last you know, short period of half an hour, OK? So just the same kind of thing you see like the MasterCard people do, where if you live in Chicago and then suddenly you're uh, you know, racking up a bunch of uh, you know, sports equipment purchases in, uh, pick somewhere, in Las Vegas, they sometimes flag that, and the computer automatically calls you. All right? The same kind of thing, if you can't absolutely protect then you have to look for suspicious activity. Uh, let's just go on here. Um, holistic approach to cybersecurity. I think at this point I'd like to s skip this one. End-to-end uh, -end security perspective. I'm sure any of you that are in this meeting are probably know that the DOE and NIST have been pu publishing a lot on uh, interoperability frameworks and smart grid standards. Okay, These are some that look at it from the security standpoint, but you could already find those on you know, on the NIST and other websites. Uh, I'd rather spend some of the remaining time on this slide because this is more of the lessons learned, things to, uh, things to really think about engineering uh, smart grid security. So one of them is to remember perimeter defense is just probably not enough. All right, I think we touched on that. RF devices require additional security consideration. Uh, one that I haven't seen mentioned too often, it's not just keeping the bad guys out. It's, you have to ask the question, why are the internal systems so vulnerable in the first place? All right? And this goes all the way back to software design and something they may do in the, the computer science school. All right? You want to look at, so do we use what people used to call at one time defensive programming? All right? Anything that's involved in the control aspect, does it check all the inputs to be valid and in range and self-consistent before the program even does everything? Right? Why is it so bad that a hacker is in your system? It's bad because they're exploiting vulnerabilities in some of the software. So if the software had fewer vulnerabilities in the first place, if people used uh, case tools, or these days there are even tools that uh, can look at source code and detect in your source code like a compiler would, this looks suspicious application, these six lines for a buffer overflow situation. Okay. Uh, you want to do as much as possible to make the actual systems less vulnerable so if there is an, a penetration, there's less that can be done wrong to actually do something bad. Software that says, well, these kind of commands don't make any sense to me, or how can you be asking for this in and then in five seconds later asking for that? Something is wrong here. Right? If, the, if the software itself is less vulnerable, you've automatically kind of raised your, uh, your security profile. Right? A correlating suspicious activity, we touched on that. Uh, this is what I call the chain rule. Uh, you know, security is only as strong as its weakest link. You have six things from a smart meter to some control input, all right? Well, guess what? The weakest one from a cybersecurity point of view can affect the whole system. Aspects of security involve privacy. Uh, we've had talks with privacy ministers, which tend to exist more in European countries than in the US. I think in the US, people that invented Facebook and everything else are kind of almost getting out of the mode of we have any privacy. But in Europe, privacy is a, is a, is a major issue. Um, and we have to keep that in mind. And there's really no difference between the word privacy and industrial espionage, except the fact that one is consumer and one is business-based, all right? And when you start to think that way, you realize this is more serious. If you've got a computer in it, includes a microprocessor, an embedded chip or something, Somebody has to have evaluated the security of it, all right? And guess what? Sometimes you just plain need an ear gap. There are systems that really shouldn't have a VPN. There are times when 
Yes, the right answer is you page somebody, they grumble at 2 a.m., and they drive into the control center, not like, oh, hang on, I'll connect to my VPN to the control center and take a look at what's going on. And there, up until a few years ago, used to find control systems that had advertisements about that. You know, Mr. Control System Manager, do you hate those 2 a.m. calls? Well, with our system, you can run it from anywhere in the web. Isn't this great? Now I don't think they say that as much anymore because it's looked as a vulnerability, okay? But one needs to balance inconvenience and security, right? And as a ray of hope, other industries have tackled some of these similar issues, okay? Uh, let's touch on a few other things. Security is risk management. Uh, this is important to view because earlier I said, well, maybe a smart meter because of a cost point might be uh, a first point of attack in a system, okay? Well, if you're buying one and a half million meters for your service territory, then the price difference between a, you know, a $200 meter and $400 meter is really important to you, okay? So you need to look at something and say, well, if I can't get these smart meter readings, how does it really affect the operation of my grid versus somebody attacks a substation, right? Or as I like to look at it, you go to a business, fly to a business meeting, okay? You walk down the hallway to your room. You see the custodian's closet, all right? It's probably a metal door with a $200 lock set in a metal frame. Meanwhile, your family's home sleeping, and they've got a wood frame door with a $50 uh, lock set on it that can probably be kicked in. So which is more valuable, the, janitor, the broom and the mop and the janitor's closet or your family? Okay, why does that scenario exist? That's risk, perceived risk management. If you're in a public hotel, then there's a bigger issue of somebody breaking into something than hopefully the front door of your home, okay? But you, one needs to keep this model in mind to deploy the right level of security for the risk involved. The traditional IT security model is, does not fit everywhere, okay? But to ignore what the IT people have done in distributed security, keeping control of laptops is important. Do you want anybody to be able to attach any device to your smart grid and it automatically pulls a DHCP address as part of the network? Well, probably not. So just like a lot of companies have implemented that if you walk in, plug your laptop in to the wall, you can't be on the internal corporate network just because you happen to walk in with a suit and tie and get past the, the receptionist. Same thing's true with the smart grid. So there are a lot of IT principles that do apply to the smart grid, and there are those that don't, and we have to look at it. Security overlaps reliability. Things that security attacks that affect the reliability of the actual delivery of electricity, you kind of have to put at the top. IP, TCP IP not being internet, I think we, we've discussed that before. If you don't design security into phase one, then when you realize that you, have, you should have done that, the cost goes up exorbitantly. All right, because property security design does affect the information flow architecture, data communication architecture, and everything else. All right, uh, one of my favorites: projects have schedules and budgets. A smart grid project, you know, you know, Comet gives a contract to IRM or into IBM. We do a smart grid project; it's considered secure by the time it's done. Well, guess what? The project is done. Everybody's happy. The smart grids don't have annoying things like project managers and budgets. So they keep working and attacking the stuff years after it's installed, all right? And it often becomes a kind of a so-called cat and mouse game. Who's catching up with whom, all right? Uh, I think look, by, given by the look on Bill's face, we're probably gonna wrap up with this slide then. Uh, don't overlook physical security and think only of the, the cyber aspects. Um, I'll go back to the, the home example. Uh, we won't mention any names. Some of you have seen a commercial where for a home alarm system and the bad guy kicks in the front door, the alarm system goes off and the people in the white shirts call and say, is everything okay? And the police arrive and everything comes out good, right? Now the security, the IT people and the people that are getting PhDs in cybersecurity, they love that because they can, the high tech system has saved the day. All right? But what you really have to look at if you're trying to operate a massive infrastructure like the utility is what? Why can you kick in the front door? All right? You know, has anybody replaced the half inch screws that go into the trim molding on your door hinges that the builder put in 20 years ago and spent $2 at a hardware store and put in two inch long screws that go into the studs so you just can't kick the door in? My God, why didn't I think of that? All right? Because 
you're trying to solve all the problems with cybersecurity, and that's just not necessarily always the answer. Even though I still encourage people to join TCIPG, just remember physical security, if you have a lot of distributed assets around the countryside, is still an important issue. You know, and thinking that way, not to the exclusion of cybersecurity, is what we have to do. At this point, I think I'm obligated to take questions. Yes. and power systems. Okay. Utilities can spend a lot of money on the smart grid, right. and you're involved with a lot of projects. Where do you see they're getting the most bang for the buck? What, what smart grid projects have the quickest return on the investment? Okay, well, that's not technically a security question, but you're right, I deal with all aspects of smart grid, so no reason not to answer that. I would say the quickest returns are in reducing power outages by knowing better what's happening overall in the system so you can better decide what crew should go to what location and do the solution. Uh, since utilities are mostly, except for the cost of fuel in the power plants, they're mostly you know, an asset-driven industry. There's billions of dollars of invested transformers and wires and everything, all right? Keeping those operational by introducing uh, predictive maintenance in uh, condition-based maintenance from having more sensors, I think, is also has a, a high payback. Okay, I, I just want to ask a follow-up on that. Sure. On the outage one, in, in determining where the outages are, that is that from smart meters or from distribution system to level devices? As we suggest utilities, the more the, every time you add a new sensor, and believe it or not, smart meters can really be viewed as a fine-grained sensor in the distribution network, what we need to look at is integrating all the information you have. All right. So if the current way you find out there's an outage is telephone calls come in and you map the phone number through a GIS and you say, wow, it looks like everybody in the street is out. It's probably this wire is down. Okay. If you have a smart meter, you can start to find that uh, quicker because a lot of the smart meters will have a so-called last gasp and send a message before they're depowered saying, look, I've got no power here. All right. Uh, the more you know about the state of the grid, surrounding the area, the quicker you can help isolate the fault. You know, and then people are putting in you know, smarter devices that do things like if there's a short underground short circuit, figure out from the, uh, you know, calculate back from the, the distance to the substation, you know, based on the short circuit current, where might the fault be? And what helps a lot of utilities is getting smart grid data, not to some central place, but back out to the field crews. If you don't have to be on your cell phone as a field crew member, but you have a nice mobile data terminal showing you any of the maintenance information, any of the metered information upstream and downstream from the substation you're working on, you can fix things faster. Because most consumers don't care exactly why the lights are out. What do they want? When is it coming back? I mean, one of the things utilities are starting to offer is sending out SMS or text messages to customers saying, we know you're out of power because your smart meter told us, right? Here's our estimated repair time because they link the workforce management system into some customer interaction system. You look at it and say, well, it's five o'clock now, they expect the power to be on by eight, everybody get in the car and go to Pizza Hut, or it's gonna be on in 20 minutes, we'll eat at home. I mean, these are important things. And you have other auxiliary things that can actually have a lot of societal benefit you getting notified that grandma's out of power. Well, if it's in Chicago winter, you may really want to know that, okay? Um, so if you, you have questions, please come up to the mic. We also right. have a, a large few questions forming in cyberspace. Oh, so okay. You're very, you're well, very maybe we should alternate one cyberspace, one audience. How do you want to okay. handle this? Uh, yeah. Frederick Sheldon says, uh, looking at security at the AMI level and accounting for the limited performance capabilities at that le level, as you discussed, what are the top three priorities, hooks, if you will, security, f top three priority security features that need to be manufactured into these devices? Okay. Uh, I hate to be asked what should the media manufacturer do. Um, you know, one area we've talked to people in the industry about is 
embedding some kind of level of hardware rooted trust in the meter, all right? Because, you know, what, what, as I said in one of the slides we didn't get to, uh, you know, amateurs attack algorithms and professionals attack key management. So when you have millions of smart meters out there, the key management aspect is likely to be one of the, the trickiest things. Um, you know, let's, you know, oh, take an example. Say you, uh, you met with your dean and he made you nervous and you left your, uh, your computer in his office. You realize that at 6 p.m. you go back and it's locked, all right? You have two choices, probably, right? You pick the industrial strength lock on there with your lock picking talents, right? You don't kick it in because this is a commercial installation, all right? You suspect that probably somewhere taped under the desk of his secretary is the key to the office, all right? And chances are it's probably true. Okay, so that's key management. That's a, a classic key management failure. Um, you know, protecting among all, all the technicians, uh, keeping track of you know what are the keys to certain things, managing them, maybe even rotating the keys on some of the smart meters, just because, you know, may be useful. All right, uh, but I, I would put the building some level of what I call hardware rooted trust. A security chip in the meter because you know for volume production reasons a lot of these things probably have a lot of standard parts in them right and since you also have to think that the meter is probably on the hacker's house all right then sometime during the night he's going to pry open the cover take a HP logic analyzer and you know figure out exactly what's going on in there and then publish the results in some hacker website so you you know making the meter a little less secure and on the utility side you would say well if the smart meter system based on my risk management principle is not as vital as like the command and control of load tap changers and, and compensators, then maybe those networks should be somewhat isolated. All right, I think we take an internal one question. One more question, All right. uh, then we're gonna be out of time. Yeah, Carl Reinhardt from the uh, Energy Systems Group at uh, UC, uh, University of Illinois. Uh, in as much as you're from IBM, can you characterize uh, IBM's efforts uh, to address smart grid issues and then uh, just, just identify the scope of those efforts. Are you talking about security or more general? I'm talking about smart grid overall. Smart grid overall, okay. Um, I don't think I'm supposed to actually advertise anything IBM does, more from the point of view of this is supposed to be a, a purely educational session. Uh, I'd say it's, in general it's probably okay to say that you know, for 40 or 50 years IBM is making things smarter, period, in many industries, okay? Uh, so our role in the smart grid is much more in the system integration, uh, the security, the deep analytics of the smart grid data, all right? You will not see a substation or a transformer with an IBM logo on it, all right? You may see integration projects that take data from existing OMS, DMS, and EMS systems, and maybe from the MDMS, and putting it together, uh, processing the analytics to give utilities a better overall view of what's happening this instant in their utility. All right. Uh, so a lot of the smart grid projects we've done would fall under the category of, say, complex system integration efforts. All right. We're also not, you know, directly replacing, uh, you know, a big some big names distribution management system or something. But we may do things to pull in a lot of smart grid data and enhance uh, the, the view of the system, the view of the, uh, the maintenance crews, the views of uh, uh, predictive maintenance. For example, one could look at smart grid and say, all that data that pours in, obsolete after the five minutes. You've centered the control center, it kept the lights on another five minutes with no interruption, data is done. Or you could say, maybe we should start looking through some of this data and correlating it with maintenance records and saying, all right, if this transformer failed, there are any suspicious little blips in any of the transformer monitoring data around the, t in the week before the failure, okay? Uh, because if you're a heavily asset-oriented industry, then spending less time maintaining the assets or less money or reacting to it uh, outages faster makes your utility look better. We have one utility that actually calls their smart grid project uh, the self-healing grid. That sounds a little magical, but in reality, the way they look at it is if the grid is repaired faster and it, the consumers see fewer blackouts or burnouts, 
then the grid is you know, kind of automagical. It looks more self-healing. In reality, nothing has improved from the, uh, from the Kirchhoff's law standpoint. Things have just improved in the overall operation and understanding of it. You know, think of uh, another infrastructure that's existed for years, like the highway system, all right? What do they do now? They look at, th what do you call easy pass here, I pass? Yeah. So people said, well, look, we'll collect the tolls more automatically, the cars will go through faster. Then people started saying, well, we could judge traffic volume by how fast the cars go through the tolls, all right? Then in some countries, people have taken traffic signal sensor congestion information, feed that back to the tolls, and I think in Stockholm and London, the price of the tolls into the city changes depending on the congestion in the city to get people to stop going through. So it's the same kind of principle. You can take what you think is a relatively simple infrastructure and by adding automation, a lot of clever thinking to it, you know, really do some great things. Okay, well, I'm sorry to say we have to end. Um, so, and we had a great turnout uh, in cyberspace as well as here. So, Jeff, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us today. We uh, appreciate your visit and all the discussions we've been having all day. So everyone, please uh, join me in, in thanking Jeff.